one. All right, guys, welcome back. Roger here with Vantage Home Loans with my buddy Norv. Uh, Norv, how you doing What's today? What's going on? Doing good, Roger. How you doing? Exciting good, day. Good. Yes, big day. Uh, we've been waiting all week for this Jackson Hole meeting. Uh, Fed Powell came out with a really short and to the point uh, speech. And I follow a lot of crypto uh, channels. They were covering this. And their reaction was, oh, this is nothing new, nothing burger. He didn't really say much. I disagree. I think this was super hawkish. I think he put his foot down and said, hey, there's going to be more pain. When, <laughs> when Jay Powell says there's going to be more pain, that says to me, that's a hockey stance. We're still going to aggressively raise rates. So that's what I think. What do you think? What did you take away from this meeting? Exactly just that. I mean, it was as hawkish as he could be. And uh, the market was looking for some softening in, in the speech and, uh, you know, and uh, some dovishness that like, you know, the CPI number from July had uh, gone down and that data point was going to uh, change the course of the uh, Fed's uh, position. And, and uh, you know, he made, made it pretty clear that they're going to take one month's uh, data and, you know, sort of change things around. And I think this is, you know, I, I was on the market side thinking the Fed would have a little bit of mercy here and, you know, considering all things, right, and the economy having come, you know, come down a little bit, slow down a bit, but not a whole lot. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they uh, made it pretty clear that, like, this is something that has, there have to be multiple months of data and uh, the labor market's really strong. And, uh, you know, until all of those things kind of line up, uh, that they're not going to change their stance and they're going to be as aggressive as they need to be. So Yeah, they're not going to take one month and then switch course. It was like, hey, there's going to be more pain where we got to get this under control. We're not even, we're not close yet. We're not there yet. Exactly. And, uh, you know, and, and it's mostly a supply and demand issue. And, uh, you know, when you look at the labor market, there's a ton more, a uh, ton more jobs out there than, than can be filled. And that's part of what mostly what they're looking at is, uh, you know, labor market, the labor market. And then, you know, if you factor in supply chain issues and um, everything from the last couple of years, these things have, uh, you know, had an impact it's a global phenomenon. Um, and, but, but, you know, the Fed's going to do everything in their power to slow demand down. And it's every, and we're not close to apparently, you know, with based on, how things are going and with their the fed's perspective on this we're not close to being there and so there's a lot of work to be done and he made it pretty clear and the market you know reacted and uh, things sold off and um you know this kind of all ties in together so after seeing the market reaction and then hearing the speech and considering all of these things um it makes a lot of sense um and i agree with uh what they had to say and, and uh considering that this speech from jack in jackson hole um, you know, comes at a time when uh, the markets rallied in the last month after the CPI number came out in July. Um, and uh, it sounds like, it seemed like the market had sort of put inflation on the back burner and that things had start, started to come down. And so the market got a little excited and I think started to speculate that the Fed might soften things up. And so this really put the hammer in the co you know, hammered in a coffin in the sense that like it, it takes out all the speculation that the market had. And this is the point that the Fed chair was trying to make today. And I think this is why he was super hawkish and uh, made it sound as nasty as I, in my opinion, and I think you agree too, um, as possible with regards to how uh, aggressive they're going to be on their next Fed meeting and, uh, and, 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 and in the future until they get the Fed's, uh, the, the uh, inflation rate to 2%, the target rate of 2%. So we're at eight and a half percent based on last month's reading just goes to show you how much work there's, you know, left to be done. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the market agrees with us. If we look at uh, everything, the whole market's down. Yep. Uh, you, know, you see that here, Bitcoin down 4%. Uh, Chainlink, Ethereum, Ethereum is down 8%. Everything's down. Everything's down. So uh, yeah, in my mind, yeah, no doubt this is going to be 75 basis points on the next one. No doubt about it. After today's speech, we're not slowing down. Um, we're not there yet at all where we need to be. 
um, and just a half a percent decrease in inflation, we're still a long, like you said, we're still a long ways away. And can you imagine if they had been dovish and the market was up 5% oh, or these stocks man. were up at 70%. And so that's exactly what they're battling is that is the uh, wealth creation, right? They're trying to diminish wealth and slow the market down when the market gets ahead of itself. So it's a little bit of a, you know, uh, balancing act when, you know, if they were the slightest bit dovish, the market liked what they heard that inflation was coming down and things have sort of stabilized. And here we are, um, the Fed's soft now, uh, then things kind of take off again. And you're now uh, kicking the can down the road and prolonging this inflation period. So by giving a speech of this sort, this really puts things into perspective. So the market sells off and uh, things remain under control. And crypto and all the other asset classes and real estate and mortgage rates, you know, will pick up a little bit uh, from it based on the uncertainty. And this is exactly what they want. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we talked about the last couple months, we had a little bit of a rally since the last Fed meeting. And it was just based on nothing. You know, Ethereum went from $900, doubled to $1,800, $1, you know, it rallied 100% uh, based on nothing based on no good news, inflation's not under control, Bitcoin rallied 40%, stocks have been rallying. And yeah, it, it's just like you said, kicking the can down the road. Um, I like this, I think this is good. I think this is, let's just nip this in the bud. Let's stop kicking it down, let's go through the pain. We had 10 years of uh, prosperity. We had 10 years of going only up. So let's go through the pain. Let's get this under control and let's get put this behind us because the worst thing you could do is go back and forth, get inflation down to 6%, switch gears, market rallies, inflation goes back up, and then you're going back and forth. Let's just get it done in one shot. Let's go through the pain. And then hopefully in six months, we can slowly reverse. So, okay. So okay. Based on that, let's make a prediction here. How long do you think before the Fed pivots? Um, hard to say, but if I had to guess, I'd say the middle of next year. Um, when, you know, a lot of the uh, indicators that we've looked at and followed, uh, you know, be it oil and uh, mortgage rates and, uh, you know, uh, uh, inventories and the real estate market in general, housing, right, it's factored into the uh, CPI and, most and energy and all that things started to really slow down uh, about March to May of this year and oil kind of a little bit after that. So I think into next year, middle of next year, and with the uh, everything that, that the Fed is doing as far as raising rates, we'll probably see some of that stabilize year over year next year. And that's probably when we'll be closer to that 2% target rate. 2% is a target rate, but I think they'll probably be happy if it's close, like around 3%, 2 to 3%, somewhere around there. So I think that like next year this time or maybe a couple in like June by Q2, um, if I had to predict. Uh, but obviously it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's tough to say, but like this meeting here today, and this is another thing that we want, I wanted to point out, and you know, we talked about this earlier, is the, um, how the importance of this, right? This meeting, and like it used to never, it, used to, it was not something that, you know, the markets are used to seeing, like in the past with Alan Greenspan and other yeah. chairs. They didn't have these meetings. They didn't have speeches, and so they had sort of left. And and now, um, they used to, so they used to look at other other things. Like they used to uh, watch Alan Greenspan walk across, you know, uh, Wall Street, and uh, you know, and and they would, you know, take take pictures of him and and try to look at the size of his briefcase. And the more papers that it looked like it's stuffed with, the uh, more likelihood that he was trying to convince the Fed committee to raise rates. And if there was, if it looked like it was empty, uh, then, you know, then, then that's when you knew that Greenspan probably had it easy and then wanted to keep rates steady. And so that, so, so when you look at these uh, statements now and these speeches now, it's used as a tool and, um, and it's used as a tool. It's, it's, it's really, it's like raising rates, right. But without actually raising rates, he gave a speech and the market reacted and yeah, yeah. sold so, off. So. so guys, but, but what Norv's talking about is, um, back in the day, how they would speculate because they didn't have these meetings, the way they would speculate is they would, where they would look at Alan Greenspan's briefcase 
as he came out of these meetings. So that's what he's talking about. So you guys can also Google, you just Google Alan Greenspan briefcase. Yeah. Yeah. You Google that and then you'll see pictures of him walking out. And then that's how they would speculate back then, depending on the size of his suitcase. Um, Cause yeah, we didn't, they didn't have these meetings back then. And maybe, you know, they may have, uh, you know, just kind of left it up to speculation and there wasn't as much volatility, but then obviously as things sort of, you know, are changed and the, uh, and so does the market. The market's just super, you know, fast these days. If you don't come out there and and uh, put in a statement, um, you know, the market can rally five five percent, if not more, on on the flip of a dime. So it's it's necessary. And these things, you know, they're using it as a tool uh, to fight inflation. And I think that they, uh, you know, the objective um, was completed today in in the speech, and it was really brief, like five to six minutes long. Uh, but he did say everything he needed to say to uh, calm the markets or, or actually change the uh, perspective of the market as far as where they're what what's going to sort of uh, be in the in the plan for the next couple of months and um, you know where inflation is and that we still need more data points they're going to be as aggressive i think their fed target uh, fed funds uh, target rate is four percent we're at two and a half um, so there's you know a lot still that um, that can be done and will be done. So, you know, right now, I think they're predicting uh, 75 in the September meeting. Um, so another 75 bips. So um, there's a pretty good likelihood of that happening at the moment. So, you know. So, so this, yeah. So uh, again, just to wrap up, uh, hawkish stance by Jay Powell, more rate hikes to come, aggressive rate hikes to come, the market. Um Pulling back, which again uh, we think is is good, it's healthy. We got to get through this inflation period and you know go through the pain. So, how does all of this affect mortgage rates uh, now, and how is it going to affect it over the next six months? What do you think? Well, mortgage rates are already pretty high. Um, so, you know, when you look at the uh, when you look at mortgage rates and the uh, you know uh, mortgage backed securities market and uh, you look at the uh, treasuries and, you know, so they're all over the place, right? And there's a lot of uncertainty and all these big things that points that we talked about. Um, and so the market's trying to predict or like be ready for the worst case scenario. And um, and banks, you know, this is also a supply and demand issue with, with lenders. They have uh, their margins set really high. Rates are near five and a half percent. And so when you look at rates at five and a half to six percent, um, after something like this, and we've come down in the last month, but now we've uh, kind of reversed that in the last few days. Um, you know, it's there's a lot of uncertainty, and as long as there's uncertainty, there's gonna there's gonna be higher rates, and it's gonna bounce around. We might get a data point next month where CPI uh, again is down for the month of August. Let's say it goes down again for the month of August. That could bring some relief, and rates can go back down. But until then. We're now on, uh, until that happens, until the next Fed meeting, or, or actually I should say the next CPI number should be uh, early part of September. Um, you know, until then we're, we're gonna sit high. We're gonna, we're at five and a half to 6%. I don't think anything's changing until then for the next couple of weeks. And if that reading is low or it's lower than July, then we'll see rates get better. But if it's not, and if it's just right where July was and, 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 it's, and it, worst case, if it's higher than, you know, rates are going to continue to go up and, uh, you know, and it just kind of can tie into the rest of the market. So it's hard to predict exactly where rates will be, but there will definitely be a lot of volatility. Um, so. OK, so right now rates are around five and a half, six percent. Um, we uh, last time we had a conversation like this, we were thinking it'll peak around five to six percent. We're there now. It may go a little higher, but really quick, explain to us. So you're saying how there's a uh, margin, right? So usually the margin between the 10-year treasury and mortgage rates is typically, is it 1.75 or 2%? Close to two. Close to two. So the 10-year treasury to mortgage rates is about 2%. So based on that, rates today should be about 5%. Is that correct? That sounds about right. Okay. So instead of 5%, rates are at 5.5%. So why is that? Why is there a greater margin there why is there a greater cushion well the banks because they don't know what's going to happen next they don't know where rates are going to go the banks have 
put in an extra half a percent cushion to protect themselves uh, and be able to sell these loans. So there's, in addition to rates slowly coming down in the future, there's this half a percent, which is pretty big. The difference between five and five and a half or five and four and a half is a big difference. So they're baking in, they're putting in an extra half a percent because they want to be conservative, right? Is that what I'm understanding? Exactly. That's exactly what it is. And it's a supply and demand issue with real estate too and loans. Volumes are down and, and there's a lot of uncertainty, not knowing where rates are going to go. They're you know, there's cost of operating, right, for these lenders. So they have to try to uh, pick up their costs. And when there's any time there's a slowdown and there's like, I don't think there's any kind of script for this type of thing. We haven't really seen anything like this happen before with what we're going through now specifically. But, I, you know, that, that, that has to be a big driver is they're, you know, um, hedging a lot of their, um, you know, margins and, and uh, you know, just taking a, p- a bigger piece of the cake at the moment. And, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. These loans, they don't know rates are going to go. And that's the biggest driver is not knowing where, you know, next quarter's of business is going to be, how that's going to look like. And so they're trying to pad that as they're pad their profits as much as possible um, while trying to stay competitive. But this is across the board, um, pretty much at every lender. And so, um, you know, there's uh, the mortgage-backed securities market and the, uh, you know, the secondary markets and all that, the uh, treasuries. And, and so a lot, there's really no playbook in how this is going to play out or what necessarily can be done. It's a day-to-day thing and as things change and data points come out, uh, the market reacts. And it's, so it's pretty reactive in that sense. But uh, one thing's for sure is that rates are going to continue to be volatile and on the higher end um, until things start to stabilize. And when things start to stabilize, that's, you know, when will be closer to um, coming back down to where things need to be and closer to that uh, spread. But uh, we do have a program. Uh, These programs were apparently around in the early 2000s and they just uh, come back out again. It's a 2-1 buy-down. 2-1 buy-down. Tell us about that. So the 2-1 buy-down is uh, is a very niche type of product. It's it's nice in the sense that it's, you know, it, it, it by design, it could fit a lot of different molds of people and buyers. Um, um, so it's a little tricky in the sense that how um, it, it, it can only be done one way, and it's through a purchase transaction with a seller credit. So the seller will buy down your rate by 2% in the first year and 1% the second year and then the third year three percent total two percent in the first year by one percent for the second 12 months and then it goes back to the note rate now uh that so the seller has to buy it down you can't buy this buy this down you can buy your own rate down and let's just say rates are well, they are five and a half percent and you want to pay a point or a couple of points right you can buy well, the rate down to before uh, we about, get before you get too far in, just tell us what it lo- what the rate looks like over the first few years. Like, what is it based like? So, rate? so a five and a half percent rate today. Yes. Uh, you uh, buy get into this two one program, two one buy down program through um, one of our lenders. Um, you'll have a three and a half percent rate for the first twelve months, and a four and a half percent rate for the following twelve months, the second year. And then it, the third year, if you haven't refinanced by then, it would go back to five and a half percent. So this gives you a little window of opportunity to have your payment lower, have a seller pay for your buy down. That money gets put into an escrow account. So the money sits in an escrow account. It's your money because you, you could choose to bring down the purchase price by as much, right? So you bring down the purchase price, your payment's going to go lower, but you have a five and a half percent rate. But the... Um, 2% rate reduction to give you as much as $1,000 a month in interest, uh, in the end of interest reduction and about five $600 the following year. So it gives you a little bit of a break and it gives you the opportunity to be able to refinance later. Now, also another, another thing, last thing I want to point out on, on this program is that um, if you do happen to refinance or sell your home before the two-year period, that money's sitting in an escrow account. It's your money. So you will be paid out on the rest of the funds. As so that is like that's to me. If you're a home buyer right now, you need to be asking about a two one buy down. So instead of paying five and a half percent, you're going to pay three and a half for year one, four and a half in year two, and then from year three to the end of the loan, it's five and a half. It's not an adjustable loan. It's a thirty year fixed. But because rates are so high now. You're getting a break in year one, you're getting a break in year two, and then in year three, 
is what you will be set in at. But based on how things are going, rates in the next two years should come back down to the 4% range, maybe the low fours. Um, so by the time you reach that five and a half, now you can go back and refinance and lock it in in the low 4%, right? Of course, we don't know what's going to happen. It's not guaranteed, but I, I think we're at the peak of the rate. So this is an amazing program. And then you just got to, like Norv was saying, you got to work out some kind of credit from the seller. You can raise the purchase price by 3% and then they give you 3% credit. So it can be like a wash for the seller. And then you get this lower rate for two years um, until everything comes back to normal, which is, which is freaking awesome. Yeah, it's a way to kind of utilize that credit. If you have a credit or you're in a sales transaction, more more, more so than not these days, we're seeing that happen, right? Where uh, there are negotiations and like, this wasn't something that we're used to in 2020 and 21, but you know, you're able to negotiate, keep your contingency in place. And if you get a seller's credit, you can apply that towards the purchase price, or you can actually apply that on a month to month basis and bring down your payment price so much. So it helps out with affordability. Um, it's not, you still have to qualify with the note rate so you still have to qualify, right, at, the five have to and a qualify half. at the five and a half yeah and uh so you still have to be able to afford it based on that rate but uh it gives you a chance to have a lower payment and that money sits in an account for you uh, uh in your name and should you sell or refinance you'll get paid out of that escrow account it's a separate escrow account um so it just gives you a nice little window to have that payment that much lower uh but it does have to be a seller credit so you do have to work out a credit with a with a seller and the agent so okay so let's do some really quick math before we go so let's say you have a mortgage of 500,000 and it's a five and a half percent rate so you got a 500,000 mortgage 5.5 interest, 30 year term. So your payment on that is 2838. So that's at five and a half. Uh, let's say you take that same 500 mortgage and you do three and a half percent interest, 30 year term, your payment's 2245. That is a difference of 2838. You're saving 592 a month in year one. So 592 times 12 months, you're saving $7,000 in year one. That's pretty awesome. So you're saving seven grand in year one. Let's just in year two. Um, in year two, 30 year term. In year two, you're saving 300 a month. So 304 times 12, you're saving 3,600. You're saving 10 grand in the first two years. And then you could just refinance and get the market rate. So that's on a $500,000 or more. You're saving 10 grand. That's that's a lot of money. It, it is. And, and so it's a little tricky, right? That 10 grand is your 10 grand. You're essentially still paying the interest. Now, so it's like the seller's paying it for you. The seller has to buy it down. But that money sits in the escrow account. You can choose to not put it towards this and just like reduce the purchase price. Or you can do it this way where you get the savings over time. I think it, it definitely helps out more to get on a monthly basis than it is to reduce the purchase price. So yeah, this, this is just for nice. anyone who's rate sensitive. Anyone who's like, I don't want to buy right now because rates are high. This is for you. So um, awesome. Well, thank you, Norv. Yeah. Uh, follow Norv on Instagram, Norv Home Loans. Uh, sure. Let us know in the comments what you guys think. Uh, what's going to happen in the economy? What did you guys think of the meeting today? Uh, and any final words? Um, no, I think we pretty much covered it all. I think this is uh, it's only to be seen what, what will happen. But, you know, I think this is this is what we wanted to hear. This is what the market wanted to hear. I mean, not, the, not what the market wanted to hear, but this is what needed to be heard um, in order to keep inflation under control since things have gotten out of, uh, you know, a little out of whack. And, uh, you know, market has started to speculate that, that inflation was cool enough. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens in a couple of weeks. Maybe we'll do another follow-up video after the uh, September CPI number. Yeah, we'll do. We'll or the do, August CPI number. Yeah, we'll do a meeting at the next um, FOMC meeting, the next time these uh, numbers come out. So stay tuned if you guys like this uh, type of content. Um, subscribe, like, and yeah, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, guys. Roger, thank you. All right, see ya. See you later. All right, bye.